Hi, and welcome to In the Studio. We record the In the Studio monthly here at the Davis Media Access Studios. Uh, the show airs on DCTV, local cable channel 15. Uh, it's also online at dctv.davismedia.org, as well as at t Uverse channel 99. And uh, with me today is a very special guest. Um, this is Ken Mercurio. And uh, I, thank you so much for coming in. I feel like this has been a long time uh, planning. And I'm, My pleasure. I'm very glad you made it. Uh, thank you. Ken recently uh, completed a book, which uh, you can see here by our side tables, which I will hold up. Or if you have it on the other shot, well, you can go to that. Um, this particular book is called Head Over Wheels. A Lucky Stiff Turns Tragedy into a Cycling Triumph. You can see it there. Uh, Ken is with us today to talk a little bit about his story about the story that uh, he documents in this book and uh, some, of the, uh, some of his road to recovery, so to speak, I would say, um, and, and, uh, and you know, what, what, went through, what you went through and all that. So, Ken, yes. um, where, first off, uh, your background, um, a little bit in cycling. I'm a cyclist myself. I think in Davis it's really appropriate that you've, you've landed here in Sacramento, so to speak, because uh, Davis is quite the bicycling town. Yes, and, and I, you actually attended UC Davis. I years did. Ago. I graduated in '73, and I must say that during my four years here, I was just a clunker cyclist. Uh -huh. I had an old beat-up bike that I just used for getting to class. I never rode it outside of campus. That's um, half the people around Davis, I think, just ride clunkers. I've seen people who use their feet as brakes. Oh. You know, it's flat. <laughs> There's uh -huh. not much uh, challenging terrain unless you get outside of town. Uh, so you were in Davis, and uh, I'm a bicyclist myself, but. You are uh, living down in Simi Valley is where you first started getting into bicycling. It is, and I uh, became a cyclist because I hired somebody at Carnation Company where I was working down there, and he also had gone to UC Davis, and he was a big cyclist. Uh -huh. And he told lots of stories about his bike ride across the country and his bike ride from Guatemala to Oregon, and it got me interested in cycling, and that's when I became a cyclist, So 79. You, you started racking up the miles, uh, commuting to and from work. That's true. Which was a, uh, which is a pretty long commute. I mean, for back then, maybe, uh, for back, the, even any time, I guess, that was a long commute. It was, was 22 miles each direction. Each direction. And you do this in rain or shine? Or well, mostly. not necessarily. Uh -huh. it does, luckily, it doesn't rain too often in Southern California, yeah. but I probably didn't do it in rain. Um, but still, 22 miles each yeah. way and usually four days a week. And this was with friends or this is sometimes with your, by your, yourself? or Sometimes by myself. Well, going to work, we would ride by ourselves. Mm -hmm. We would go in groups home from work because back in those days, work ended when the alarm went off, you know, at 5 yeah. o'clock. And right. we would leave at the same time. And uh, I rode with other cyclists. So then you, got, you started uh, noticing that, hey, I'm not too bad at uh, cycling. You enjoy it. You started riding longer rides. You started riding centuries, which are 100-mile rides. Yes. Uh, you started riding double centuries, which are 200-mile rides. Here in Davis. Here in Davis. Mm -hmm. And uh, you found that you were, you did okay on those as well. Right. I, I was a long-distance runner here at Davis oh, okay. on the track team and cross-country teams. So I have the endurance heart yeah. and lungs. And yes, that, that transposed uh, over to bicycling, and I was a good long-distance cyclist. Right. And then at some point... Uh, and I don't know exactly what year this was, you decided, okay, you've been doing these distance uh, races and, and, and fun rides, I guess you'd say, yes. uh, for many years. You decided you were going to do the Race Across America. Well, that was, wasn't the Race Across America. Okay. It was a tour ride across America, but it was very fast. It was 32 days. 32 days. So we have a picture of that that I would like uh, the director to bring up. Um, and I don't know if you can see it. That's a picture of you. Oh, uh, yes. That's the at finish. the in, that's at the finish. Yes. And that's on a particular. Do, I, since we'll get into what happened to you, I would like the viewers to note uh, the bike that you're holding there because uh, <laughs> that is particular the bike that uh, you had your accident in later. So note that, viewers. Uh, I want to show one more picture from that ride. This is called. This is ride. Right across, it's not the right across America. It's not a race. No, no. It's it's a but it's just a tour company, for-profit tour company called America by Bicycle. Gotcha. And it's their fast ride across America. So you can see in the font's pretty small, but I'll, so I'll read it that uh, your final uh, final mileage was 3,540 miles over 31 days of riding. Yes. So it's a that's a daily average of a hundred and I, 14 miles 114 miles per day yes for 
how many days again? 31 days. 31 days yes. straight. Well, any uh, not days? straight. It was 32 days with one day off in uh, halfway, 15 days in Topeka, Kansas. We had a day off and I rode 21 miles touring around just to see Topeka. Yeah. But uh, anyway, there was one day off. And uh, besides that, you rode some days you would ride more than they was needed to go the distance, I guess. Well, yes, I sometimes took little off tours to go see sites because I mm -hmm. thought I may never get back here again. So I sort of had a reputation of the 25 of us as being the person who would take little personal side, mm -hmm. side tours. So that alone is a pretty big accomplishment. Yes, right? Riding that was across the, the country. People do it, but it takes them two months. They stop a long way. This was uh, 31 days, and uh, you know that's a pretty... All this just goes to show that you <laughs> were an experienced cyclist. That was the best shape of my life, was when I completed that ride across the country. And uh, you uh, started going on some club rides, or club rides in Simi Valley. I joined a club after the ride across America. And on one of those club rides, uh, uh, particularly one that was difficult that you were working up to as a challenge, uh, you had this accident, and so that's what brings us to uh, your current uh, condition and the current story and yeah, sort of life-changing. my neck that moves this much. <laughs> your life-changing accident. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, about what happened or what uh, uh, what I guess uh, we, you know without getting too much into the details. Your bike broke. The, um, the fork. The yes. fork broke, and so uh, actually, I, why don't we show that a picture? It's not of your fork because I you know we didn't have one, but this is a fork. This is an oh example my, of a yes. carbon, fi carbon fiber fork breaking, and it gives people an idea because, you know, when they think of bikes these days, they might think of steel bikes, but this kind of shows that these are fibers and that it's a, basically a, a pla it's, I guess, plastic, but I, I, you know, I don't know the, ex it's a carbon fiber. It sounds fiber. like plastic. When you tap on it, you think you're tapping plastic. Right. So your fork broke, and we'll talk a little bit about the, uh, you know, the technical side of that uh, in okay. a minute, minute but... Um, what happened to you is that you were you flipped over because the fork went. Actually, there's one more shot I'll show. Uh, there's a that's ah, that's your you wheel. Have, yes, that is the, the fork, wheel. The fork that broke then flew into the wheel, and uh, you can see in that shot that there's a lot of spokes that were just completely taken out, which is not an easy thing to do. <laughs> the no. spokes are under a lot of tension. Yes, and uh, they're in there pretty solid, even though they look pretty spindly. They're actually pretty, uh, pretty solid yes. uh, devices. That wheel is strong. That wheel but is strong. It collapsed under half the spokes breaking when my broken fork went into the spinning spokes. At 28 miles an hour, I was going very fast. So I think that's the key, is that the 28 miles an hour is a, uh, it's, that's a pretty fast pace. Not I was many, going very fast. Not many people uh, go that. You were, like you said, you were in the good shape. You were on the club ride. I, yes, I was on a, a pro training ride. It actually wasn't a club ride. Okay. Uh, I, I went on club rides all the time, but they stop and wait for you, and you can go any speed you want. This was the first time I had ever done this famous pro training ride that was called the Simi Ride. And I lived in Simi Valley, but I could never qualify, so to speak, to stay up with the pros until I was in the good shape that I was in because I rode across the country. <laughs> so, and this was the first the ride The first gone time I them. ever tried this ride, when people in the club said, you know, you, you're good enough to do this Simi Ride with the pros. Just go ahead and give it a try one day. So the one day I try it, yeah, and so <laughs> my you, bike breaks. So you, your bike broke. You flipped over the bicycle. You landed on the top of my head. Uh, sort of just like a pile driver. I mean, uh, <laughs> yes. And you're straight down. Do, you don't. Rem you were. You were knocked unconscious. That's right. And I have no memory of the fall or lying there on the road. Even though I was speaking to people who stopped to help me and conversing with them, I have no memory of it. Uh, so you were conscious, but uh, their memory was not uh, registering. That's right. My first memories came hours later. And when did you discover how uh, the extent of your injuries? And how? And I guess, uh, when did you discover them, and what were the extent of your injuries? I guess I first have snippets of memory with the neurosurgeon talking to me in the emergency room that same afternoon. Mm -hmm. It happened at about 9 o'clock in the morning, and I'd say it at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon is when my memories are first there. Uh, little snippets, though, of them saying, you have a serious broken neck, and you can either wear a halo, which they, they uh, screw into your head, or you can have surgery. So the halo is the device that's got uh, uh, metal. metal on it, and you have to wear that your, uh, the rest of your life if you don't. Or, or Well, no, okay. you, you wear it 
and ke to keep your head completely stable so that your uh, broken um, vertebrae can heal. Okay. And in that case, if I had worn a, a halo and it had been successful, I wouldn't have this uh, restriction that I now have because what they did instead was the surgery to implant rods with screws screwed into my remaining vertebrae to permanently fuse my neck. Right. And they decided they had to do that because it was so pulverized, so sensitive, that they were afraid to even do anything with the halo. So the, uh, ex that's, this sounds like, is it a, is it a common injury? Is this an uncommon injury? Uh, is it this type of injury? Aren't people normally, their spinal cord damage, I assume? Oh, yes, yes, yes. The, the doctor, this is part of the miracle of the, of the book of, of me even being here, is the doctor could not believe that I wasn't paralyzed or dead immediately because of the severity of the broken bones surrounding the spinal cord. Right. And if he, he couldn't understand how if it's pulverized completely surrounding the spinal cord, how could the spinal cord not have been nicked or in some way injured, which means paralysis or death? As long as that spinal cord is at all injured, it's death or, or paralysis. So somehow the bones surrounding the spinal cord, because I'm not, I don't understand yes. uh, exactly, you know, the, uh, the the body parts of it, but the bones surround the spinal cord and the entire bones, the vertebrae were broken. Yes, pulverized. and what the doctor called pulverized when he did the surgery, he could yeah. actually see it. Yes. And, uh, but the spinal cord, no. No, no injuries to the spinal cord. So the doctor has told me every time he would see me, it's a miracle that you are here with us. Yes. Uh, and not with any uh, uh, paralysis. Right, and so you elected for surgery. I assume uh, you went right into surgery. Well, and... I would have elected for surgery anyway, but he told me later the surgery was the only option because it was just so sensitive, so pulverized. Okay. Um, so um, now back really quick. Uh, we could digress really quick into the, um, to the accident itself. Um, I was interested, being a bicyclist myself, uh, about the carbon fiber breakage and... Um, I I'm read quite a bit about carbon fiber over the years, and I've been riding bikes, you know, relatively newcomer, I guess, relative to you uh, since '89 or so. Uh, or you know, 80, be, as a kid, I rode bikes, but then riding bikes, uh, you know, with a mountain bike and on the road and whatnot since yes. about '89. And uh, I mostly had steel bikes, and I've oh, and when carbon fiber came out, I you know, there was a fear: well, could this break or um, have catastrophic failure? And I'm wondering if that, uh, if you knew about that, or if you sort of, uh, if you feel that, uh, you know, the manufacturing was, I guess, you know, that gets a little bit into uh, part of the story of the book. But uh, if you could speak to carbon fiber in general and what, what you've. Okay, found I'll have out. to say I didn't know about the potential for catastrophic uh, breakage when I bought the bike, the, the Scatante bike that had yeah. the carbon fork. Uh, and I even had a carbon fork on a bike before that. But all this time, no. I, all I heard it's was not that like carbon... The, and the manufacturers don't say there's potential for catastrophic No, no, no. Failure. In fact, they say carbon fiber is stronger than steel or, you know, the strongest thing you could imagine. Yeah. But that requires good uh, manufacturing process to have okay. it be stronger than steel. And unfortunately, uh, this particular fork was an off brand. It wasn't one of the major brands that you see out there like Trek or Cannondale or Specialized. No, it was an off brand. And... It turned out they didn't have a very good manufacturing process because right. we discovered later that when they lay down the carbon fiber sheets, right. they, didn't, they didn't lay them down tightly enough and they were little air pockets. And over time, because I put 13,000 miles on that bike before the right. accident, the air pockets can grow and expand into bigger voids and that weakens the fork. So it, it's, they also wouldn't say that, though here's the lifespan of this thing that you're buying. And don't ride across America with it. No, they sure don't say those things. Uh, they they sell the bike, but in in fact, uh, you know, you might have been a higher user than an average person, but uh, it certainly wasn't at the shouldn't have been at the end of its lifespan. No, no, it certainly wasn't supposed to have been. It, it was a manufacturing defect, yes. and most bikes today still have carbon fiber. I mean, if if fork breakage on a bicycle was a fairly common occurrence, you wouldn't see people riding carbon fiber forks. No, that's uh, true. It, my incident was very unusual. It just doesn't happen. Or if it did happen, people just wouldn't be riding them. I, so, but, uh, it, but on the other hand, and just to throw this uh, back a little bit, uh, there are, it does pieces. happen. Yes, it does happen. I but mean, just being a bicycle nerd, you know, I'm aware of the 
there's a website called uh, Busted Carbon or something <laughs> like that. And uh, um, there are cases. Yeah. There are cases where people will, will post that, and I don't know if they're off brands or if they're. Sometimes it's the you know you have to tighten metal sometimes around the carbon if it's a seat post. Right, right, and right. You people can over tighten. tighten. Yeah. Yes. So, um, so it does happen. It, it true. also happens it with metal. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned in your book that um, one of your riding partners had it happen on a metal bike. Yeah, Dave Pressler, who went to UC Davis and was a bike racer himself out of B&L Bike Shop right here in Davis, uh -huh. um, had it happen right next to me. Uh -huh. uh, he was speeding down uh, a hill out there in uh, Saugus, and he started feeling wobbly. And when he got to the bottom of the hill, he got off and just pulled it apart. And uh -huh. there was his fork in his hand. And uh, right. he's just lucky he didn't fall. Uh, luckily, steel is a little more forgiving yes. about how quickly it breaks apart. It's not uh, spontaneous. It's not, the, right, right. He started wearing a helmet from that day on. Yeah, I think the, <laughs> I, you know, I think the trend towards wearing helmets is good, especially for when you're going fast. I think uh, sometimes, you know, uh, the, uh, I guess the, our, in our lawsuit driven world, I don't know why, if I want to say that, but helmets can be sometimes relied upon too much. If a bicyclist is hit by a car and the car, uh, and the you know car driver says, well, they weren't wearing a helmet. That's why they're <laughs> yeah, hurt. Yeah, that's well, why I know. You know, actually, they were hit by a two-ton truck, and so that's probably why they're hurt, not because they weren't wearing a helmet. But on the other hand, going at speeds of 28 miles an hour, you should definitely be wearing a helmet. Oh, absolutely. I would never. I've never gone out without a helmet ever. Right. Um, and you know, we don't want to scare viewers away from biking. <laughs> uh, this is a pretty uh, amazing experience that you went through. Um, it turns out that they were. Uh, defects or uh, manufacturing defects as you as you mentioned um, it's not uh, it's not uncommon manufacturing defects certainly happen on cars and any kind of vehicles that you travel on so um, I think you know knowing the risks obviously <laughs> still bicycle yes and I still have a carbon fiber fork too <laughs> right but it's, it's just that it's a name brand and I am more confident yes. in the quality control that these manufacturers use right so um, I want to talk a little bit about the aftermath of what happened, All right. and uh, you know the um, the process you went through, uh, sort of mentally. Um, you had you suddenly became a very independent person, a very dependent person, and I wonder what that was like. You had to depend on everyone to uh, for your for your uh, for your for your care. Yes, well, that's the importance of family, friends, and love, mm -hmm. and uh, and you had to depend on all of them. I'm kidding. <laughs> Emotion. <laughs> yes, I sure did. And uh, another fortunate thing for myself is I, my family tends to be the optimistic kind of people. And uh -huh. I kind of get that from my parents. And luckily, I didn't go through too long a period of feeling sorry for myself. I kind of moved very quickly to setting goals for well, recovery. It, it sounded like to me that your goal to <laughs> recovery was pretty <laughs> much the day uh, that it happened. Um, and we should, we should mention that. Um, you, uh, you, this accident happened, uh, you were in the hospital, and you'd already paid for this Blue Mountains Parkway tour. The Blue Ridge Parkway. Blue yes. Ridge Parkway, uh -huh. sorry. Yes. And, uh, you know, your, some of your first thoughts uh, <laughs> when you were able to have thoughts again was, I got to get back to the, to the Blue Ridge Parkway, and, uh, and is this possible? Yes, that's, that's true. It, it took me about a week to decide that maybe this is possible. One of the first things I asked on the day of the accident to the neurosurgeon is, am I ever going to be able to ride a bike again? And I don't remember asking that, but people told me that I said that. Yeah. And that kind of cracks me up. But uh, it's, uh, it's part of your, <laughs> the cells of your inner right. being. Uh, exactly. So I wanted to know if I could ride again. And I just wanted to know how serious is this break that I have. But once I realized that it's possible to ride a bike again, that's right. when I became aggressive about my recovery goal of continuing with this ride that I had previously registered for that would be nine and a half months from the date of this accident. So nine and a half months, you are, uh, you have had surgery. You're <laughs> luckily to be alive yes. because your spinal cord was not uh, either severed or nicked or, you know, I don't, I don't know the terms. And you're already thinking, the doctors have said, well, okay, it's going to, you can't move your head. You can barely move your body. Uh, you're not, you're dependent upon everyone else. You have a, it sounds like this group visiting angels, which was through your churned company, were helping care for you. And you're sort of already thinking, uh, I want to become independent again. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I wanted to, to recover as quickly as possible. I wanted my story to be like those inspirational sports stories I had read as a child 
of the comebacks people had made when they were against the odds. Right, and it's not, I, I thought it was interesting in your book that you mentioned, um, it, it was about getting, you know, that having the final goal was not necessarily just so that you can go enjoy yourself on a bike ride. It was so that you can build the independence uh, for yourself and not necessarily have to, you know, put everyone out or whatever, you know, for... Uh, exactly. I, I wanted to have my life return as much as possible to being what it was before the accident. I, uh -huh. And so that what was the process that you went through to uh, get up to that, uh, to, to actually get to back to normal, I guess? Well, after a, a couple of days of finally, I would say during the week that I was in intensive care in the hospital, I did have a couple of days or three where I was feeling sorry for myself. Why me? What's going to become of my life now? I'm glad to say that that did last only two or three days. I became more positive as I started to feel better. It's kind of like as soon as you physically feel better, you kind of have a better chance for your mental outlook as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I just wanted to set a tough goal for myself and hope that I, I, at that point, I didn't know that I could ride a bike. I was told I might be able to ride a bike, but I just thought I want to do whatever it takes to get myself back to having as normal a life as possible. And if part of that can be riding a bike again, I'm going to go for it. And did you set your own milestones to get to that goal or did you, were they sort of uh, given to you or how did you actually? They were, it turns out I, I achieved the physical therapy milestone faster than I was told I was going to be on physical therapy, but most of them were set for me by the neurosurgeon. Mm -hmm. But, but, the, but not knowing that he, you actually wanted to do this Blue Ridge Parkway. Well, right? yeah, he, he knew I wanted to ride a bike again, but he had no idea that I was actually pointing toward doing something as difficult as the Blue Ridge Parkway, which was 500 miles in five days. And what kind of, uh, how difficult what was that ride? We it was can, very difficult. I guess we're giving away the story to say that, yes, you actually did complete <laughs> yes, it. Yes, it was my goal to be able to ride a bike again. And once I was able to ride a bike again on the street, I had to train like heck for two months to get ready to do one of these most difficult bike rides you can do. And you were, uh, when you did start riding your bike, were you, did you have, you can't, you still can't turn your no, head. No, no, no. This so is as you... much as I can turn my head. I had to rely on a mirror for the first time. And I'll have to tell every cyclist out there, Everybody should use a mirror all the time. I, um, I'm pointing to this side. It was actually on my left. Uh -huh. um, but I've realized how important having a rear view mirror is to know what's coming behind you. But that's how I see behind me. And I have to stand up on the pedals and turn my whole body left or right to be able to see left or right. Because uh -huh. I, I really, I can't see, I can't turn my head much. And what about uh, tilting your head up so that you can see ahead of you? Is that oh, well, that... I'm very upright. Okay. That's one of the big differences between what I could do before the accident, I could be a typical cyclist and you get in those aero bars and you can get down real low, but I can't do that anymore. I have to be very upright with my hands on the top of the handlebars. Mm -hmm. And my handlebars are raised up on a stem that's three inches. It raises my handlebars three inches. So, so I'm very upright to see straight ahead. Right, and so you lose a little bit of aerodynamic. Yes, I'm not aerodynamic at all. The, mm -hmm. the headwinds <laughs> are a killer. And this particular ride, you said, is 500 miles over five Over five days five with 45,000 feet of climbing. So it's very hilly, very uh -huh. mountainous. And um, did you uh, I talk a little bit about regaining confidence uh, in, in order to uh, you know, achieve those types of miles, not just the I physical know. part <laughs> of it, but the confidence to be back on a bike. It, did you go back to where the accident happened? And, uh, oh, yes, because it was right in my hometown. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, it's just lucky that... One of the lucky things about this unlucky event was that if the fork was going to break, it didn't happen somewhere on my bike ride across the country. It happened right in my hometown. Yeah. Um, but yes, on about my third or fourth bike ride, once I could ride again, I went down the main drag of Simi Valley, the main street where it happened, and I went right past where it happened. But by then I'd been back there physically, not on a bike, but I'd been yeah. back there to see it, and I'd gotten past that emotion. And the, as far as building the confidence to ride in traffic, to ride with uh, on a road where there's other cars, I mean, did that take a while? Yes, or? that that took longer. Uh, I would say that took uh, uh, a few days of just riding in non-traffic areas to get the confidence of relying on a mirror and relying on what m my limited mobility neck could yeah. do and just getting the feel of riding a bike again where I, I'm very upright and I can't suddenly turn around to see something. So yes, that took a lot of miles of riding and hours of just riding back and forth in a non-populated area to get used to riding again. I, th I think that, you know, 
getting the confidence uh, does take a lot of miles, and I think uh, you know having the education helps, but also just getting getting those miles in. So that yes, you you're gain right. Confidence on the road. I brief, briefly wanted to mention uh, writing the book itself. Um, this was you were you were not an author by trade. No. Um, this is but yet uh, did you have an editor or how did no. uh, so you no I, it started out while I was recovering and I just had a lot of time on my hands because I was wearing a neck brace and a chest brace for three months straight mm -hmm. and then after that I still wasn't allowed to ride a bike or anything I just um, was doing physical therapy and just working my neck as much as I could prior to prior to physical therapy I could, was not allowed to move my neck at all. Mm -hmm. Once the brace came off I could start to move my neck but during that time of just hanging out I started to write a story just because so many people asked me what had happened I decided I've told so many people the answer of what I was told happened. I have no memory of it but I was told later by other people in the group what had happened and yeah. so I decided to write it down just as a permanent story for myself and for family and somebody who might want to know what happened but the more I wrote the more I became interested in documenting how I even got good enough to ride in this pro training yeah. ride, which took me back to my, the beginnings of my cycling career. And then I was writing about the, the uh, physical therapy and the recovery and the thoughts going through my mind about family and friend and support and my goals. And pretty soon it just kept going until I decided if I complete this goal I've had, this recovery goal of completing the Blue Ridge Parkway ride, that could be the end of this story. Sure. Well, then once I was done with it, it looked like a book. <laughs> well, it, it looks like a book. It reads yeah. like a book. And uh, I would congratulate you just on the accomplishment uh, of, of uh, overcoming this accident, but also in writing the book. And well, I think thank I, you. It took years, though, for a, a publisher to uh, accept that as a manuscript. Well, uh, <laughs> you should, must feel good now to see that it's actually in print. Oh, what a feeling that even hearing that it was accepted for publication was the biggest <laughs> thrill I've had. Well, I want to. Uh, we don't have too much time left, so okay. I just wanted to uh, thank you so much for coming in. Um, I want to let everyone know if they're interested. I think this book does resonate with cyclists. I think your story, uh, from beginning to end, uh, resonates with thank cyclists you. as far as uh, how you got involved and what happened. Um, hopefully, uh, people can you know learn some lessons, I guess, but also just uh, see, be inspired. And I, I uh, hope so. I hope they realize that they can overcome hardships and handicaps of their own by setting goals, working hard, and you can achieve these things. Yeah, step by step. Mm -hmm. Right on. Um, I, if people want more information, they can go to sunburypress.com is the website uh, where this book, the publisher of this book. Uh, you can also, in the latest issue of Bicycling Magazine, um, this is the, an issue of Bicycling Magazine, which uh, bicyclists all know about. It's the, probably the top publication in bicycling, and there is an ad in the back where you can also find out about Ken's book. So Ken Mercurio, thanks. Uh, and I should also mention, this show will be airing after you appear at the Avid Reader, but you did appear at the Avid Reader, and I hope you have a good time at that tonight. Um, anyway, Thank Ken. Thank you, and the Hall of Fame Bicycling Museum on uh, Sunday. Yes. Oh, excellent. Yeah, the Bi U.S. Bicycling Hall of Fame yes, also in Davis. Yes, that's at uh, 1 o'clock on Sunday also. Oh, well, this is, I think... <laughs> People in Davis are definitely, it's a treat to have you here, and I'm glad, well, thank get, you very much. glad they'll get multiple opportunities to talk with you. So uh, thank you uh, again, Ken, for coming in. You've been tuned to DCTV Channel 15 on the Comcast Cable System. This is In the Studio. My name is Jeff. Tune in next week for yet another episode of In the Studio. Thanks very much.